go ahead and turn to Psalm 107. And while you're turning there, uh, I got I got grabbed by one of the one of the kids, and he says, "Hey, I learned a verse." And I said, "What is it?" And he says. It's John 8.32, so if I misquote it, I'm throwing him under the bus. <laughs> but if you know it, or you have, if you have the Gospel of John handy, it says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And believe it or not, that really encouraged me, because you, you, know, you get up here, me, Jay, Jim, Britt, Manny, whoever teaches, you know, the Lord puts something in your heart, and... You want it to be from the Lord. I just don't want to get up here and talk about Andy Griffith and eating pizza. That's just a waste of time. So you pray and you hope that this is going to hit, that this is from the Lord, that it's not just me, because if it's just me, it's the longest 45 minutes that's, that's ever been invented. So, you know, we're singing the songs, and, you know, the worship leaders and the preachers, we don't get together and say, hey, could you sing this, could you sing that? But as Kathy's leading us through, you know, the weak saying they're strong and uh, the, the poor saying they're rich, it's kind of a little nudge. The Lord saying, you know, because I was really doubtful because I didn't want to talk about what I'm talking about. And a little nudge saying, yep, you're supposed to talk about this. And then my man Jax comes up to me and he says, John 8, 32, you should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And that was a little nudge. Yeah, you're supposed to talk about this. Because it's not, you know, your typical ha-ha, he-he, Jimmy Grant message. And it's, you know, I don't give tearjerker messages because who wants to cry? You know, you don't get paid extra to cry. But, um, you know, my pastor, he, he taught this way back in the 80s when it was really cutting edge. And, uh, you know, me and Carice, we were heading out to the school and we were listening to one of our guys and he was talking about depression. And that started a conversation between the two of us. And as we were driving out, I said, you know what? I think the Lord is writing a sermon here. I think we're going to be talking about this. Because this whole topic of of depression, it's kind of like it says in Hosea, you know, Hosea, he says, Ephraim is like a cake unturned. It's like a pancake that you're cooking it, but you never, ever flip it over. So one, one side is crispy black, super done, and the other side is raw. And that's kind of the way our culture deals with depression. Because there's one group that everything in the world is because you're depressed. Everything in the world is because of your your mental breakdown and this and that. And, you know, and it's kind of been cooked to death. Because for a lot of people, honestly, a lot of people, it's a get out of jail free card. It's a get out of whatever you don't want to do card. And they have burnt that side. But then you got the other side. And I think we Christians, we lean more to this side. There's one side that is raw. Because we Christians, we come along and we ignore it. There's, there's no such thing as depression. You're just sad. Just suck it up. Just get over it. And if you've lived long enough, if you've been through stuff, you realize, yeah, depression is real. You know, it like all like all the isms, you know. Racism, sexism, uh, COVID isn't an ism. But I, I've learned that everything has a touch of reality to it. But people grab it and exploit it. And then everybody just says, it's fake. And depression kind of falls into that, 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 that same category. So, you know, we Christians, and like I've told you, we, I've, I've hung with the Christians um, for a good long time. And... We Christians, the way we tend to attack it is we say, well, Christians, you shouldn't be depressed. You know, Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. We quote that verse, and I'm going to call Christians out. Christians use that verse, and we have no idea what it means. If you really want to confuse a Christian, say, hey, could you give me a definition of joy without using the word happy. Yeah, there you go. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. But it's, it's a hybrid. And I'm going to break my own rule that I just left that, uh, laid out. But it is a hybrid. It is happiness 
mingled with peace. That's why you can have joy in the midst of your struggle. Not necessarily happiness, but a joy, but a peace. And we use that verse out of context and say, well, you, you shouldn't, you know, the person's already feeling horrible. And we come along, we say, well, this, you know, we throw these verses at people that we don't understand. Uh, we tell people, well, you're probably not saved. And can I, I've, I got a list here of, of people from the Bible that if you read their story, you're like, if he wasn't depressed, um, he was real close. <laughs> Noah. Noah came out from being in the ark, and you think it'd be a great time. Noah got drunk because he didn't know what to do with himself because he comes off of this great victory. He's vindicated, and it's an extreme letdown. So he says, what else? What, you know, he just gets drunk, and, and he, has to do, he has to put it somewhere. You got John the Baptist. John the Baptist is rotten in jail. He knows he's supposed to be the forerunner for the Lord. And he says, well, if you're not the one, tell me, because I'm sitting here rotten in jail for nothing. So he was, he was pretty much down. You got David. Have you ever read the Psalms? I mean, like, what's this guy's problem? Because he's mm, mm, was like, it, I would not have liked to have hung out with David because one day David was like, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Then the next minute, you're like, oh, kick their teeth in, Lord. Step on their kids. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Where was the happy guy? And so he's up and down. You look at Moses. Moses, just kill me. Elijah, we're going to look at him. Just kill me. Jeremiah, just kill me. Jonah, I wish I were dead. Are you sensing a theme here? And so, but these are all guys that not only were they saved, they were God's men, but they, these are some of the hot shows. These are some of the heavy hitters. And the whole point is that whole, well, you're not saved. That just doesn't hold water. And then people say, well, you're probably in sin. Now I'm going to put an asterisk by that. That was supposed to, supposed to be part of this message. We're just not going to get to it this morning. So breathe a sigh of relief. So the title of the message is The Big Deal of Depression, Part Uno. Because I know that uh, if it was part uno y dos, we'd be here all todos las dias. We'd be here the whole day. And we're not, because then everybody would be depressed and it would be my fault. But I've noticed another way that we Christians tend to deal with it. And this one, it bothers me. I've, if you know me, you know it bothers me because I talk about it all the time. It's, it's what I would call the, the Lloyd Braun way of dealing with depression. Who's, who's Lloyd Braun? If you've ever watched Seinfeld, maybe I shouldn't make that analogy. Edit it out if it's going to stumble you. Forget I said Seinfeld. Remember from this other church, this guy named Lloyd Braun, uh, he had this thing that he wanted to uh, teach to Jerry Still. And he says, whenever you feel yourself getting stressed out, just say serenity now. So for the whole episode, Frank Costanza is going around, serenity now! And every time his wife gets on his nerves, he's like, serenity now! And then Finally, the guy go, comes up to me and says, you, you know what you might want to tell your dad? Knock that junk off. He says, because it only works for a little bit. Serenity now, insanity later. And then finally, he's, you know, he's serenity now, and, and then he goes in and he breaks a garage full of computers. And we Christians, a lot of times, hey, just, just put on a happy face. You know, I wish I were dead. I, I feel horrible. I feel like, you know, I'm not even safe, but, you know, I'm, I'm around the Christians. And I just feel not happy faith. And, you know, because the joy of the Lord is going to be my strength. It's like, man, knock it off. I'm, I'm tired just looking at you. And a lot of times you can tell because it's such a put on. It is so belabored. And it's like, wow, just what, what is your real problem? Because I know it's in there. And, you know, you talk to people. And these are the people, they, they've read the joy of the Lord, they don't understand it, but they, and they take that to mean, I, I'm smiling about nothing, I've got that far off blank smile, uh, and they laugh at stuff. I mean, they're laughing at jokes you haven't told. I consider myself a wee bit of a jokester, so I, I uh, you know, I wish I could walk around with a laugh track all the time, but like, but when I'm, I'm not saying anything funny, but <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you're laughing at it. What's wrong with you? And you sit there and you just kind of watch them and you're just like, just walking away slowly, slowly. 
And see, the problem with that is it is serenity, a.k.a. I'm fooling all you guys, or you're fooling me, or we're fooling each other. It's serenity now. But you keep doing that. It's destruction tomorrow because you can only take so much. We see it so often where Christians, oh, I can't believe they're getting divorced. I can't believe they're just, you know, leaving their family. I can't believe he's not a Christian anymore. X, Y, and Z. What happened? Because a lot of, I never thought it would be him because he was so good at putting on this face. I never thought it was her because she was so happy. And I'm not saying go around and be Mopey Joe all the time, but you know what? We, we serve a real God, which means we need to keep it real with him, which means when we are brokenhearted, we need to say, Lord, I am brokenhearted. When we are mad, we need to say, Lord, I am mad. Because pretending the problem doesn't exist does not solve the problem. It just pushes it down the line. And, you know, since I'm talking about it, I might as well define it. Um, because, well, seeing as I'm telling business, might as well tell my own. Uh, the last, I've said it, uh, the last 10 years were kind of kind of rough for, for the Grant family particularly for me, because uh, everything that could go wrong, when, you first, when we first went into it, you know, I, I, we had to close up the church, which wasn't fun. But we figured we were going to go and fight crime and ride, ride around with Ponch and John, so it was okay. And then about three months, they said, hey, you stink, beat it. I'm like, okay. I guess God just wanted me working at the hardware store. There's no shame in that, but after a while, that gets kind of old. And I remember getting up each morning and thinking, well, at least no one's dead. That was, that was what I could, I could hang my hat on. Everything else is falling apart, but at least everybody's still here. But then you know what started happening? People started dying. And not just the distant aunt that you see, you know, every fourth year at the family reunion. You know, my dad, my mom, my brother. And then you can't hang your hat on that anymore. And then you have, to, you have to do something with it. So then, you know, after, it, after you start to feel a little bit better, then the, the hospice company, they always would, as soon as I would start to feel better, they'd send me this, this flyer just to remind me that my dad was dead because evidently I'd forgotten. And they'd say, you know, you might be going through depression. And in case you don't know what it looks like, it looks like this, that, and the other. And I was like, wow, check, check, and check. You know, awesome. And it didn't really help me. But having said that, this is, this is the secular definition of of depression. It says the persistent feeling of sadness or loss of interest in activities causes significant impairment in one's daily life. It is, you're in such a fog, you're in such a, a, a funk that you can't function. You can't do the necessary things. You can't do the fun things. It's like you're a prisoner in your own soul. It's a little bit beyond just being sad. And then it says, God bless you. The symptoms are changes in sleep patterns, your appetite, your energy levels, concentration, your daily behavior, self-esteem, your appearance. You know, I, I read that. I mean, this is years ago. I was riding a forklift and man, I, I didn't have two loves to give about anything. Uh, you know, least of all, my appearance, you're thinking, what's changed? It was worse then. Because, I mean, I had the half row going, and I didn't feel like cutting my hair. I had the beard that was all bushy over here and bald over there. I didn't care. And I'm looking at, the, at myself in the rearview mirror at there, and I'm like, well, that's Ann's problem. <laughs> you know, she, she's got to look at that. I don't care. I could care less. Hey, Jeremy, you know your performance is this and that. I don't care. What are you going to do? Fire me? I'll go find another turkey job. I don't care. And that's, that's where I was. And I didn't need someone saying, hey, cheer up. Hey, get over it. Hey, Jesus died. And you know what? He did. But, and that is the truth. But don't, don't come saying that kind of junk because it doesn't help. It's a truth, but it's not a truth for that, that moment. Sometimes you just got to sit there and be quiet and look pretty. Or for you guys, sit there and look ugly and be quiet. But the emphasis is on, on being quiet. And this whole thing about of depression, you know, and I'm not a psychologist. I took a psychology class. I got a gentleman's B plus, if that helps you. But 
It has, you know, from the Christian perspective, it has three major roots. Number one, you got the medical slash chemical. You got the situational. Someone has just died. You've gone through severe loss. Or you're coming off an extreme victory. You've got, well, yeah, I'm going to say it. Sometimes it can be a result of sin. And we're not going to talk about that this morning. But first and foremost, with the medical and the chemical, and I cannot stress this enough, if it's a medical condition, Go to the doctor. If you've examined your heart and you're like, well, I'm not in sin and I, there's nothing going on that's, you know, wiped me out, but all those symptoms, go to the doctor and they can check you out and say, hey, you know, your, your brain is designed to give you chemical this and that, but for some reason, your brain isn't, isn't producing that. So we're going to give you the supplement, and there's no shame in that. Because guess what? If you're a diabetic, I want you to take your insulin. I do. Everybody around you wants you to take If you've ever seen it when someone, you know, misses their insulin shot, you're like, bro, next time, please take your insulin. So if that's the case, take it. I mean, they may, go, they, you know, you may go in there and say, hey, you know, I noticed you're on the, the vitamin C diet. Uh, candy, candy, and more candy. Well, you can't, you can't eat, uh, uh, you know, wall to wall candy and junk anymore. You have to, you have to slow, you know, slip in a vegetable, and kind of regulate, you, you know, your nutrition. And a lot of times that can that can square it. You know, I'm going to throw, you know, what Paul Paul said to Timothy. He says, Timothy, take wine for your stomach, because Timothy had an intestinal issue. You notice he didn't say, Hey, Titus. You take wine because you're sick of dealing with Cretans. That's not what he said. He says, Timothy, you take wine, a little bit of wine because it'll kill all that bacteria in your stomach. If, you know, I went and I'm, I'm just going to throw myself in the group. I got the camp flu or the camp sickness. So you know what I did? I went and found just about every half empty bottle of NyQuil in the house. And, and I drowned that junk. I mean, it, I don't know if it kill, makes you feel better, but it helps your mind not being sick. Uh, it makes you sit down somewhere. And so if you're sick or, or, or something is lacking, go to the doctor and, and take care of it. And see, you know, everything that happens in this room, everything that should happen in Christendom, it is it, it swings on the hinge of honesty. You got to be honest. If, if it's a soul issue, then you don't need to be throwing medication at it. And if it's a medication issue, you don't need to be throwing spiritual stuff at it. Because one thing that I've seen is people that need to take their meds, they want to come down, they want to confess sins, they want to get the victory, but they need to take the meds. And then people that need to confess their sins and get the victory, they want to throw a bottle of pills at it. And you got to be honest with yourself and you say, you know what? I'm not sick. I'm sinning. If that's you. Or there's shame in it, I, you know, there, because that's why people hide it. And a lot of people, I'm, uh, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm, I'm a-okay. We don't believe in that stuff. And some people would rather be in sin than just to admit, my body is failing me. It's not producing something I need. And so if you're in column one where it's, I, I need to go see a doctor, go see a doctor. God bless you, go see a doctor. If it's a solic issue, then you need to deal with the soul. And now, having said that, we are in Psalm 107. And the number, the second one, and we're going to camp on this, and this is where we'll camp and talk and talk and talk and talk and end. But the one that I think most of us go through, this, this root of depression is, it's situational. You feel bad because you've just gone through something bad. 
you feel de- deflated because you've been on this high and now you're coming down and you don't know what to do with it. And that's, well, we'll, we'll read a little bit. It says, verse 1, Psalm 107, he says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Well, that seems like an, an odd verse to start off when you're talking about depression. It's a great verse to start off with if you're dealing with depression because a lot of times we look at our problem and right out the gate, you, you kind of got the prescription to correct that because who are you looking at? Where's your focus? It's on the Lord. He says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and the south. Now, obviously, this is a primarily a, a prophecy about Israel. He says, they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Now, you, you look through the Bible. The Bible throws out certain phrases that that's how they called it. That's what they call depression. Their soul fainting within them. There it is. That's depression. He says, and then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul. He fills the hungry soul with goodness. And those who, oh, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's the next time. That's next week. But right here, he says they, these folks, they're they're going from station to station. They're, They're wandering. They're hungry. They're thirsty. They're pilgrims in a strange land. Hebrews tells us that's us. We're living for a home that we haven't yet been to. We're living for heaven. So there is this doldrum. There is this depression. There's this distress You don't have to be in sin. It doesn't have to be chemical. It can just be life. The ups, the downs, the blahs, it can wear on you. See, think about this, because I can still remember the first time I encountered death. And it wasn't like I saw this man die. I just remember he was there one day, and I never saw him again. I just, that's, and, and, and because, and it probably explains a little bit of the crazy, but, you know, uh, I, I remember being in church and crying a lot. I just thought I hated church. But I'm looking back, I was remembering the funeral. But I just put it as, I hate church. We cry in church. And then, you know, mom was putting me in North Hills at the time, so they, you know, they, had, they were testing me and everything, and they, said they were a little bit concerned because I was drawing tombstones and crosses. And she says, well, we probably should have found a different babysitter for him that day. But, you know, he's, you know, there was a guy in his life and he died and, you know, kind of waking him out a little bit. But every last one of us, we have that first memory of a death of a loved one, a, a death of someone near and dear to us. And it's, you know, it just didn't feel right because it was never, ever designed to be part of the equation. Way back in the garden, death and sickness and sin, all of that stuff, it was never, ever designed to be part of the equation. Death is the new normal. So when a person dies, it is the most unnatural thing for the uh, the body to go through. That's why the body fights it so hard. And when, you know, when you see a loved one die, that's why you feel like you're dying because it was never designed to be that way. And, And my whole point is, as we go about our life, depending on how much gray we have, all it is is a bunch of death and setback, and hurts, and a bunch of stuff that this soul was never designed to carry. And we carry it, and we got to find somewhere to put it. If we don't, it will, it will wipe us out. And it's just, just the everyday 
stuff builds up. It, it's not even talking about if you have a stressful job or if you're a first responder, then it skyrockets. But we build, and, and everybody tells us, if this bothers you, something's wrong with you. No, if it doesn't bother you, something's wrong with you. And by the way, and good job to all of us, but where else could we go? We're dealing with it right now by coming out and praising the Lord and putting our eyes on him. But my whole point is you live enough life if it's not that big thing that just totally knocks you on your rear, it's a bunch of little things that start to build up. And I think about this. I wanted to read another verse, but I need to cheer it up because holy cow. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4. It says this, and, and we'll kind of continue on with this point and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Paul says, but we have this treasure, this gospel, this life, this hope of heaven. We have it in us, but we are carrying it around in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels back then, they were just baked dirt. They were fragile, but they did the job. They're easily broken. You get where I'm coming from. We carry around this hope of heaven, but we're extremely fragile. We like to pretend that we're not, but we are. All it takes is a tap on the right side, and we fall to pieces. And he says that the excellence of the power may be of God and not us. Even though we're weak and we are subject to depression and weakness in the flesh, God says, I'm putting this hope of the gospel in you, not so that you shine up the vessel, but so that the gospel shines through the cracks of that weak vessel, so that people can see my strength in your weakness. That's why putting on a happy face and pretending, that's why, you know, that's one more reason why it's wrong, because you're also taking God's glory. Oh, I've got it all together. But you can say, no, I don't have it all together. But you know what? God, God is the glue that is holding me together. He goes on. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may, may be manifested in our body. We carry around the sentence of death, but we also carry around the hope of the resurrection. Weak vessels, and who am I, and who are you, and who are we to think, not me, not us? All it takes is someone to just bump us, just in that right spot, just to bring up that wrong or right thing to trigger us. And then, then we're like, yeah, Lord, it, it's still a thing. It's still an issue. And just part of travailing through this life. But I mentioned Elijah, and I want to turn there and just to give you a little bit of hope. We're going to read, we're going to talk, then we're going to pray and go home. But 1 Kings chapter 19. And I often have said it, I'm glad we got all of heaven, all of eternity to, to go around and meet people and talk to people. I would like to talk with Elijah. I'm glad I'm talking with him up in heaven because I think he called fire down on me if I, call, if I talk to him here. Because he just, well, he reminds me of someone I know, someone who likes to wear a leather vest, someone who's weird looking, someone who's kind of a hot temper and kind of goes, up and down. but, you know, a lot of people... They're like, you know what, I, I am depressed because I just suffered this loss. Or it's not a loss, but it's just the way my life is. And it's a drain. And I'm, and I'm wiped out. But did you know that sometimes, I mentioned it, you can be coming off of a great victory. And then the next day, boom. They call it, what do they call I think they call it... Uh, the, the Monday after 
because those guys, they win the Super Bowl. And I mean, this is what they train for their whole lives. And then they, they win the Super Bowl and they are going to Disneyland. And then, then they're all bummed out the next day when, the, you know, when they're coming out of the hangover. I mean, for the guys who aren't Christian. Um, and they come out of it and they, they say, is, is that it? I mean, I've, I've invested my whole life in that. And I mean, my feet still stink. I'm still ugly. I mean, you know, nothing important has really changed. So it's a big drop off. But Elijah, he went through the same thing. It says, now, now this is after Mark, Mount Carmel. You know, it's been a three and a half year drought. Elijah has been defamed. He has been ridiculed. He has been painted with a bad brush. Ahab and his crazy wife, they're the bad ones. They're the reason that the drought is on the land. Elijah's the one guy, so he thinks. He's the one the guy that's standing up for, for what's right. He's the one herald of truth. And every time he comes into the court to set Ahab straight, you know what Ahab has the nerve to tell him? Is that you, O troubler of Israel? You're the problem, Elijah, because you're pointing out the problems. You're the problem. And I love Elijah because he says, hey, man, I'm not the trouble of, of Israel. You are. And I'll throw in a little Jeremy Grant, you turkey. And so, and so he says, hey, I tell you what, Ahab, because this little back and forth, it's gotten OLD. I am tired of it. Because you think Baal's God, I know Jehovah's God. Let's have ourselves a little contest. Let's go up on Mount Carmel. And you and your, your little prophets, you can set up your little, your little uh, uh, altars. And I'll set up mine. And theirs was all fancy. And his was just earth, wood, and mud, and stone. And he says, we're going to have a contest, and we're going to see who the real God is. And, you know, the prophets of Baal, they came out, and they cried and travailed and acted all kinds of fools and started cutting themselves and falling out. And then this is, this is really why I think me and Elijah could be cool until we weren't, because he starts to make fun of them. <laughs> I mean, if you know me, and I think you guys are starting to get no, if I can make fun of you, and I think you can take it, I'm going to do it. Okay, if I can make fun of you and I know you can take it, I'm going to do it because that's when the fun really starts. Because um, it's all about the reaction. So Elijah comes on, the, the man of God. And I get this a lot. Oh, Jeremy, you're a man of God. You say this, man. Jeremy, you didn't. Okay, read your Bible. Because uh, he comes out and he says, and he says, hey, maybe, maybe Baal is on a trip. Yell louder. Man, I could see myself doing that. I've done that. And this is my personal favorite. Maybe Bill is in the little false idol's room. Maybe he's, you know, maybe all this fatty calf that you're bringing him has finally backed him up and he's dealing with it. Wink, wink, nod, nod. So just give him a couple minutes to handle his business and then he'll come. And he's, he's bringing it up and he's mocking and they're cutting themselves. And they finally give up because they're, they're, you know, close to bleeding out. And they, they say, you know what? It's, it's your turn, Elijah. And he does something that I think we as Christians need to do. He made it hard for God. He didn't grease the track for God. He says, this is going to be so difficult. And I'm putting myself out there and God out there. That when he shows up, everybody's going to know it. And I mean, this is treasonous stuff because he says, take all the water, dig a, a trench around it, put water in the trench, and I want you to douse the altar with water. Just a reminder, they're in a drought. Um, um, uh, we live in California. Do we know anything about droughts? <laughs> so, I mean, you, you water your lawn and then you got your, your neighbor, <laughs> Governor Newsom. Jeremy's watering his lawn again. Okay, CHP's coming out? Okay, okay, who's the best? Thank you, bye. And then, uh, so we, we know all about, you know, everybody was all uptight and, oh my gosh, she's wasting water, and what's he gonna do? And these guys were praying all day long. Elijah kneels down, and he shoots up a simple, quick, real, sincere prayer. And the Lord shows up. And he sets the whole place on fire, spiritually and physically, so much so that the water was licked up on the altar. It was licked up out of the trench. That altar was obliterated. 
when God showed up. They can never say, oh, it was a trick. It's like, no, he made it as difficult for God to show up as he possibly could. And look what God did. And right there, I mean, people responded because they, this, man, the Lord did something. We, I mean, I was kind of wondering if God was the Lord, but he is because look what he just did. And so they went and they started killing those prophets of Baal. I mean, like I said, they were probably dehydrated and worn out anyway, so they weren't putting up too much of a fight. So you think this guy, you think Elijah's like, well, right on. Altar call time. Come on down. The bus is wait. Your friends will wait. Whatever else Billy Graham would say. Nope, this is what happens. It says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. This guy's a child, but anyway. Um, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that this, this note, he arose and he ran for his life. And he went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. He just stood up against the king. He stood up against the people. He stood up against the priests. But this queen comes out and says, you're dead. And he says, I'm gone. And, it, you know, you may say, well, big deal. This belongs to Judah. He was a prophet to Israel. He had no business being down in Judah. He was totally in a place where he wasn't supposed to be. It gets worse. It says, but he went himself a day's journey into the wilderness and he came and he sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. He said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my brothers. I think it's all of it. I think he's coming down off of this tremendous victory. I think it's three and a half years of him being the bad guy, of it being his fault. People saying it out loud, him probably thinking it in his heart. You know, he says, I did pray. I asked the Lord to shove to heaven, and he did. And all the people are suffering because of the prayer I, I threw up. And it's all hitting him right now. And he says, it's enough. I'm tired. And maybe you've been there where you're just like, you know what? I'm just tired. I'm physically tired. I'm emotionally tired. I'm spiritually tired. I'm just, I'm just tired. And there's no shame in that. Because if anybody had a right to be tired, it's this guy, because he was doing something. And so then he looked, I'm sorry, and then as he, as he lay underneath the tree, under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, arise and eat. I can't help but be happy when I hear those words. <laughs> Get up and eat, just cheers me up just reading that. Sometimes you just need a sandwich. No, seriously. I mean, sometimes you just need a sandwich. I remember when my pastor died, Jay and Kathy knew him. They were, they were his friends. And uh, Jay came down. You know, Jay obviously was pastoring up here. We were down there. I was living in Richmond at the time. And, you know, I could see the Golden Gate from my sister's house. And I just, I, I didn't know Jay well. I knew of Jay. I met him once. I knew Jay was one of the good ones. And I just, I just called and left a message on the machine one Sunday, the Sunday. I said, hey, Pastor Mike's probably going to be clocking out. So I just thought you should know. And I got up the next morning. I mean, I'm a half hour, if that, away. I drove into UCFSF Park, did my whole thing. And I got up there, and you know who was there? Good old Jay. And so we went through the whole process of Pastor Mike trans transitioning to the transferring to good old heaven. And, you know, Jay, he walked me through it because I, you know, I'm the pastor now. He says, hey, read this. Now read this. And then after we all kind of dealt with it, he says, tell him. And I thought that was just about the most unspiritual thing I'd ever, I'd never heard that before. <laughs> and I, you know, but I'm like, okay, I could always eat. And so, you know, we went across the street and there was a little food court and we, you know, we just sat, 
eight, and, and the lady, the nurse who was there, her name was Miriam Pagan. And one of Pastor Mike's sons, little Mike, who he has a, a, a sharp sense of humor like me, we're there eating, and Mike says, did anybody else notice that our nurse's last name was Pagan? And then, you know, when we all laughed and we ate and, you know, and, and, and Jay later explained, you know, when you go through something like death, something extremely traumatic, it drains you. It wipes you out. You don't feel like it does, but it does. And you even feel guilty. Here, this other person has gone through this thing. This person has died. This person is sick or hurting. And I'm, I'm eating a sandwich. Oh, boo, who poor me? But if you're there he- helping them, carrying them. Yeah, poor you. you. You need to eat something. And I love it because I read this and I do think of Jay. You can say this kind of stuff when Jay's not here. But when you're down and out and you're tired from you've just done something extraordinary or you're just doing the ordinary for a long time, you need two of three things that this angel gives him right here, which Jay, unbeknownst to him, gave me that day. It says he came and he touched Elijah. And when you're down and out, and when you feel like you just don't have any strength left, you need that touch from heaven. Be it from a brother or a sister, someone who's going to lay hands on you and pray for you. Or that Bible study, or that little devotional that someone sends you your way and just reminds you, look up. We all need it. And then you need that practical help. Because this angel says, hey, get up and eat. Because you've been running for your life. You're tired physically and emotionally and spiritually. You need to feed the beast. You need to, you need to feed the machine. And we need, to, we need to realize that as well. And it says, so he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and he touched him. And he said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. He says, arise and eat because this is not where you're supposed to stay. You got more walking to do. So he arose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights as, as far as horror of the mountain of God. I wish they had stuff like that, that at the academy. I could have used some magic bread like that. Um, <laughs> and from there, he went into a cave, and he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He's in the spot where he's supposed to be up there in Israel. And he's kicking butt, and he's taking names, and he's doing a great work. But then he gets spooked, and he runs, and he takes off. And he goes to a country, he goes to a place where he doesn't belong. But then he doesn't stay there. And then he goes out into the wilderness. But there's no help in the wilderness. And then the Lord meets him in the wilderness because he will. And the Lord says, you need to get back to where you're going. So being a hard-headed prophet, he goes somewhere else where he's not supposed to go. And he goes into a cave, which is often a symbol of despondency, depression, darkness, just being down and out. So he says, well, you know what? How much worse could it be? Let me go and make it even more miserable. Let me revel in my misery. And he goes there and he's hunkered down in the spot where he's not supposed to be. And the Lord, the word of the Lord comes to him in the, in the spot where it's not supposed to be. You look at, at Elijah and you see the grace of God. Because a lot of people, well, if you leave the Lord, he's going to leave you. If you forsake him, he's going to forsake you. And he's doing this stuff and he's worn out and he runs to a place where he doesn't belong. And the, the Lord chases him and says, oh, by the way, you're not supposed to be here. Oh, by the way, eat something and drink something. And by the way, you're not supposed to be here. And he says, all right, I got some strength. Let me just keep on going in the wrong direction. And finally, the word of the Lord comes to him. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And I hear, I hear Bill Cosby when I hear that, when he's there talking to Vanessa and Rudy. He says, come here. And they look at him and he says, here, here. And I hear the Lord saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? Here, here. What are you doing in this cave? Because last time I checked, there's a rogue king and a crazy queen out there wreaking all kinds of havoc. You 
can't stay here. And see, that's the thing I want to get across this morning. If you're there, there's no shame in being there. We've all been there. If you're there, it's not a sin to be there. But I tell you what, you cannot stay there. That's just a fact. You cannot stay there. You cannot live there. You cannot put down roots there. And the Lord will send people. The Lord will stir up a message, a happy message to say, you cannot stay there. What are you doing here? You got you to gotta get up. And so he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek to take my life. That's, that's why I'm here. Because life stinks, and it's always stunk, and it's always going to stink. And if you're honest, you've said that to the Lord. And that's what Elijah, this prophet, basically is saying. And then the Lord said, I'm done with you, and he obliterated the cave, and he killed him, and it was the end. That's not what he said. It says, then he says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and a strong wind tore into the mountain and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. Sure this wasn't in California? I'm just saying. (laughs) But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And so it was when Elijah heard it, He wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood in the entrance of the cave and suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He says, I'll ask you again because sometimes we don't get it the first time. And so you got to bless his heart because he says, well, Lord, I'll, I'll take you back to verse 10 if you want me to. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant torn down your altars and killed your prophets by the sword. I alone am am left. And they seek to take my life. And then the Lord said to him, go. And that's about the third time the Lord told this guy to go. And if if you can't, yeah, I think Jay says it. If you don't know what go means, it means leave where you are. And he says, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Moholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And basically says, you think you're alone? You're not. There's a whole heap that you don't even know about. You're not alone. And three things that I think, if you're there, we need to be just reminded because that heavenly touch can come in a sermon. It can come over coffee. It can come in a conversation, just when the Lord shows up. Hey, let's let's go out and get something to eat because you look wiped out. I mean, I think all of us, I mean, this is Calvary Chapel, so I think we're all good for that. But then, and I think a lot of it, the thing that really gives depression its hook on people is because people, just like Elijah, because you may think I'm being sacrilegious, but basically that's what he was saying. Maybe he had just washed the Grinch, but he says, stink, stink, stunk. It, it, it stunk yesterday, it's stinking now, and it's going to stink tomorrow. So why, I'm not going, you know, I'm not going to put on a happy face, Lord. I just want to die. I'm t- I've, I have done my part. I have done enough. And look at what I have to show for it. And he says, well, got it. Let me reiterate. Get up and go where you ain't. And this, this is a courtesy. You're not alone. Get up and find these guys. By the way, 
you feel like there's no hope for tomorrow, there's people that you need to pour into that are going to carry on. You can't clock out yet, Elijah, because you still have work to do. There's still people that are watching you. There's still people that need you. So you got to keep on. And here's the thing, the practical points, because my goodness, good Lord. Yeah, part one. Indeed, it should have been part one point A. But, you know, what to do? And whenever we finish this, I'll say it again. Seriously, you're dealing with it. And, you know, not to be the, the, uh, the bearer of bad news, but if you're not, you will. Because life happens and it happens to everybody. There is no bonus for pretending. If you're hurting, tell the Lord that you're hurting. If you're hurting, you grab a brother, you grab a sister that you trust and respect, and you tell them, I'm hurting, and this is why. And you get that heavenly touch. If it is chemical or medical or you just need a sandwich, take care of it. There's no shame in that. And it's it's simplistic. It's not simplistic. It's just really simple. The thing is, you know, we're going to go outside. The sun is still out there. But if you grab a quarter and you hold it up just right, you can block out the sun. Quarter's not huge. Anything, if you hold it up in the right light, at the right angle, it can block everything else out. And if it is not medical, and if it is not something that is related to your nutritional habits, if it is, as they say in the Bible, a sorrow of the soul, just because of wear and tear. Something really bad has just happened and you're coming down off of it or something bad has just happened and you're coming out of it. But either which way, you're worn out. We talked about this at camp. Consider Jesus. You look at Jesus. You focus on Jesus. I did that yesterday. And and it worked. I felt better yesterday. But here I am. It's Monday, time to go to work, and I feel like trash again. Well, about that. Jesus is still around. He works on Mondays. And we say, Lord, here I am, and I'm still an M E double S. Help me, Lord. I'm I'm falling to pieces. I need you to put me back together once again. Lord, I'm going to choose to not look at this thing that is horrible, that is bad. And it's been dealt with. Did you know most of the things that we have anxiety over, most of the things that we go into depression over, they are are things that happened years ago. They're gone. You can't fix them. You can't deal with them. So we got to leave it behind. Over and over and over again. And it's not just enough to leave that but we run to him. And what does it say? There we will find rest for our souls. Well, I'm tired. You look tired. Go eat a sandwich. We should have had a potluck today, but we didn't. Let's stand and let's pray. Lord, You are not a depressing God, but Lord, we live in a world, we live in a fallen world where bad things happen. We've seen bad things. We've done bad things. We've just experienced bad. And it takes a toll. And even if we're like Elijah's and we're fighting a good fight, it still still carries a, a huge toll. Lord, for any in this room, that are struggling. You, some, I hate to even say the word, but struggling with that depression, Lord, to the point where they just feel lost. Lord, touch their hearts, Lord. Lift them up. Lord, redirect their focus 
away from all of it onto you, Lord. And Lord, that, um, that your joy would be our strength, Lord. The joy of pleasing you would be the thing that strengthens us. So Lord, lift up this fellowship. Meet these folks where they are. Mend the brokenhearted. And for those folks that are doing good, wow, praise you, Lord. Keep it going, Lord. But bless your people. And Lord, that we might bless you right on back. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen.